I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Ah, fresh kale, it's so great. You know, Mother Nature, she is so cool. What a woman. She puts all the produce in front of you you should be eating during that time of the year, and that's called a season. Guys, well, what about grocery stores? Everything's apparently in season, right? It can get a little confusing, true. But as a chef, I want flavor, so I'm gonna quest for the freshest stuff, which means in season and local. It's cold out, right? So this, of course I'm gonna find this, cabbage, fresh and delicious. But what about live cilantro that Joe showed me? That really piqued my interest. As it should, Nathan. The key to controlling your growing environment when you can't control the weather is with a greenhouse. From the most sophisticated commercial operations like this one here in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia to the simplest home setup, it still comes down to two basic requirements, sufficient sunlight and proper temperature. But if you're out to reach the masses, there's no margin for error, and it helps if you can set yourself apart in a unique way. Shenandoah growers claim to fame is not the size of their greenhouse operations. It's the fact that they're one of only a few greenhouses in the country that's able to label their products as certified organic. Timothy Hayden is the president and CEO. In the 20 plus years of operation, they've really worked at perfecting their craft. We started with just a small hydroponic greenhouse and have always maintained the vision of growing both sustainably and naturally. So when the opportunity for certified organic production came along, we consulted with some of the best organic minds in the world to ultimately bring this greenhouse to Virginia. So we grow 365 days a year in the greenhouse and by controlling the environment, uh, we're able to grow even in the dead of winter when it might be single digits outside. Our plants don't know any different. It's 70 degrees every day of the year in the greenhouse. At any given time, we may have up to a million plants in various stages of production, anywhere from germination to harvesting. And as we add new plants every day, we can't afford any glitches. So it's vigilance, good attention to detail are essential to ensure we have good, consistent quality products grown every day. But by the end of the day, it still comes down to the basic elements, controlling the light, water, and temperature. And this applies to a commercial greenhouse like this or to the home gardener. I see that you guys are, looks like doubling the space of your greenhouse right now, so obviously business is booming. What do you attribute that to, Tim? Well, there's a growing interest in local food production, sustainability, mm -hmm. certified organics, and a segment of the market that uh, is eating healthier, experimenting with more cuisines, and these fresh herbs offer a wonderful way to enhance the flavor of food and do it in a natural and healthy way. You guys are in the right business for that. We're very passionate about this and work very hard to provide the very best products for our consumers. So this is where the process starts then? Yes, this is our automated sewing line. And what we do here is you see we drop the nursery trays onto the conveyor. Uh, the magazine of pots fills the tray yeah. with pots. And then it's ready for the first critical step in organic growing, and that's the organic, certified organic soil. Right. And it's very rich, biologically active, provides a nutrient and the things we need to help the plants grow. Okay. From there, the, uh, the tray makes its way around the conveyor, and it's ready to receive a broadcast of certified organic seed. Okay. So in this case, we're seeding basil. And each and every pot gets a consistent broadcast of seed. That ensures uniformity and consistent quality at harvest. Okay. From there, 
The, we continue down the conveyor and we give them a shot through the watering tunnel, irrigate it, and then the nursery trays are ready to go to the germination chamber for the next step of the growing process. Right. Nine hundred and ninety-nine, a thousand, and you guys do this every day. We do. Oh gosh! All right. Unlike the germination room, where it's really important for darkness, now it's all about the light, and you guys are racing the clock. You want as much light as possible. So, what about in the winter when the sun is low or on a cloudy day? What are you doing? We use a grow light like you'd use in a home greenhouse, only they're much brighter. Okay. Yeah. Right. Similar but different. Yes. Tell me about the watering process here because that's super important too. Well, once the nursery tray is placed in the uh, table, as we just did, mm -hmm. it's essential that the freshly germinated seed is kept moist. Right. So we'll top water the plants for the first few days while they're in the nursery to ensure that that moisture persists. Okay. And then once it gets down a little further into the line, everything's germinated, it's a different process. From there, we use an ebb and flood system where we flood the table with organic nutrient. Yeah. The plant then uptakes what it needs through capillary action, and it's able to grow as it makes its way down the nursery. Gotcha. So this is the main growing line then? Yes, it is. On average, how old are these plants at this point? Uh, it takes about 30 days from seed to harvest. What are you looking at? What are the primary things that you're really keeping an eye on here? Well, one thing is we like to keep the plants dry, so we're irrigating the plants from the bottom. The plants can then uptake what they need. That keeps the foliage dry, which is very important in certified organic growing. Hugely important, period, but especially in certified organic because you're not using any synthetic fungicides or any other synthetic chemicals for that matter, including pesticides. That's correct. We actually use uh, biological controls to control the pests in the greenhouse. Uh, we use predatory insects such as ladybugs and other insects that will hunt down and keep the insects that we don't want off the plant. Now we use that in combination with mechanical pest control where we brush the plants uh, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. That will disturb any insects that may be present on the plants and capture them on yellow sticky tape. Right. We can then inspect the yellow sticky tape, see what may be present, and then adjust accordingly. Now, judging from the looks of these plants, and of course, the incredible taste of the cilantro, these are about ready for harvest. Yes, they are. Uh, at this point, they're ready for harvest, and we'll either uh, cut the plants for packing or we'll sleeve them as a live plant, bring them into our cooler, and then they're, re they're ready the same day for shipment to supermarkets. But these don't go on any airplanes. No, no, this, is a, this system is ideal for reducing food miles. And in fact, uh, we like to think that this certified organic greenhouse system is an excellent example of how you can produce commercial quantities of certified organic food produce and you can do it sustainably. Well, this is a great example of that indeed. And um, this cilantro is fantastic. I think you could send me home with a little bit of this. I've got somebody that could put this to use. I think we can set you up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Might you. take one for the road. Awesome. Those commercial greenhouses are pretty incredible on how they have everything down to such a science. But what about those backyard greenhouses? You know, the ones we all want? Well, let's face it. They go from really elaborate, like this one here, down to the most basic. But there's one thing for sure, no matter how expensive or inexpensive, they all have a few things in common. Tim Martin is the estate gardener at this home, just north of Atlanta. In addition to keeping the grounds looking great all year, the greenhouse is an important part of Tim's work. I've been gardening for a long time. I've been working in greenhouses for a long time. This one, three or four years, what I have found is that regardless of the size of the greenhouse, lots of the principles are the same. Even in a space this large, there's a limit to how many plants. More is, is definitely not better in terms of air circulation, light circulation, that sort of thing. Bringing too many plants in, into a tight space often will increase the problems. The look is wonderful. It's a very tropical feeling. For every additional plant that you're bringing in, you tend to be bringing in more insects, more pests, lots more problems. Air circulation is probably the biggest thing to be aware of in a greenhouse of any size. We've learned a lot about lighting, that, that we regularly need to shuffle plants from shadowed areas to direct sun. 
Interestingly, as much as we want all of the sun coming in, one of our biggest issues is having too much sunlight. It becomes almost like holding a giant magnifying glass over a plant leaf, and we end up frying things. Some of the plants, we have them in here for fun. We have them because they do really well. They give that greenhouse look. The alocasias, the calocasias, the gingers, the banana is here really because it's fun. It, it, it's sort of a classic greenhouse plant. Ours was this tiny one gallon, six dollar plant eight months ago. It's now taller than me. It grows a foot a week and just keeps going. We haven't figured out what it's going to do when it hits the ceiling. We're hoping that perhaps it'll bloom and bear bananas. By limiting the number of plants that we have, we're also proactive in terms of really encouraging light circulation and air circulation to keep things, particularly funguses and scales and such down. Everyone thinks about having heat in a greenhouse, which is obviously a big deal in the winter. It's more of a big deal to have cooling elements during the summer. It doesn't need to be elaborate. Even a greenhouse like this doesn't have air conditioning. What we do have is we have three thermostats. One will turn the heat on when it's cold outside, but then another thermostat just opens the louvers. It's a really big deal. If, if you have a smaller greenhouse, it's as simple as unzip the side panels so, so that you're letting out the hot air. And then the third thermostat that we have just starts exhaust fans. Once it reaches 90 degrees in here, the exhaust fans come on to really pull out hot air. What every greenhouse has in common is that it, it gives gardeners our fix of that warm, damp garden air in the middle of winter. It, it happens to be 14 degrees today and it's ridiculous in my mind as a gardener. There's something wonderful about coming inside a greenhouse. Even if that's a four by four little pop-up thing on the patio, it's just a wonderful thing and, and it gets gardeners through the winter. Well, Sherry, this is what I would call a gardener's greenhouse. It looks like you have got this thing maxed out. So with all these plants growing here, what type of space are we talking about? How big is this greenhouse? This greenhouse is 8 feet by 12 feet. It's not big enough. It will never be big enough. <laughs> okay. Get the next size larger or whatever you can afford. I am so sold on having a greenhouse, but there are certain do's and don'ts, right? Absolutely. You've been doing this a long time. You're a hobby greenhouse person. You've been at this how long? Uh, 13 years here in Georgia, two years in Colorado. What are the main things that we need to know? We're watching this. We want to say, I'm getting a greenhouse. What are those basics? Well, what you need to do first is find out if you can even have a greenhouse. Um, county codes make sure what their restrictions are and even in neighborhoods um, don't allow outbuildings including greenhouses so that would be my first um, suggestion. Better to find out ahead of time. Exactly you don't want to be disappointed and find out you have to take it down later. Okay well let's say we get the green light for that and it's okay to put a greenhouse in our backyard what's the next step? The next step is finding the perfect location for it. Um, you want to maximize your sunlight that you get especially in the winter time because it's lower so you want to face the long part of your greenhouse to the south. And, and the east sun is also very nice in the morning. So that would be second most important. And if you can't find the ideal spot, then just do the best you can. All right, so now I'm ready to set my greenhouse up, but I know there are certain must-haves and certain don't-dos. Let's talk about the must-haves first. What do I have to have in here? You have to have good air circulation. It's healthy for the plants, it cuts down the diseases, um, and it's just the most important thing to have a healthy greenhouse. And you've done that a number of different ways here. I see fans, I see vents. Walk me through the different things that you do. Well, as you said, the fans are the number one circulation. I keep it up off the ceiling to keep it circulating. I keep fans at a different level to keep it circulating mid, and then even another fan at the lowest level. So it's all mixing. Talk about the venting because I know that helps let the air out at certain exactly. times. Exactly, and that's very important. We have these vents, they're automatic vents, do not require any electricity whatsoever. Um, you can set them by what temperature you want to open at. Mine open about 80 degrees and the wax expands. Uh -huh. Yes, these valves are a very clever application in a greenhouse. 
those cylinders are filled with wax, correct? Correct. So as the temperature heats up, the wax inside expands, it puts pressure on the cylinder, and it causes that vent to open. And then as the wax cools, it closes them. So between the combination of the air circulating with the fans and of course the vents, you can put a cap on how hot it really gets in here. Exactly, and believe it or not, in Georgia, I've never had my greenhouse over 90 degrees. That's pretty incredible considering we know how hot it really gets outside in Georgia in the summertime. <laughs> That's true. Now let's talk about the winter time because it can get really cold as well and you have a way to control the temperatures there too. Exactly. And with the air circulation and the heater, I also have a wireless thermometer that I can tell what's going on in the greenhouse. And it's especially wonderful because you can set it for freezing and an alarm will go off and so you know to come out and check your babies. So for the rare times that where you're not actually in the greenhouse in that time machine <laughs> exactly. scenario, you can be in the comfort of your home exactly. and know exactly what kind of temperatures we're dealing with out here. Exactly. So you've got the heater that has a thermostat of its own, so it's kicking on and keeping this at a relatively warm temperature. Correct. And I keep, my greenhouse is considered a cool greenhouse. And once you get a handle on the ambient temperature, it's still important to control the temperature of the soil. Yes, and I do that by having propagation mats, one that has a thermostat and one that doesn't. And that's because certain seeds require a certain temperature level before they'll germinate, where some of the other ones just need to be, you know, 20 degrees or so above the ambient temperature. It's not as critical for them, right? Correct. But greenhouses are so versatile for growing all kinds of things in addition to just starting plants from seeds. You do a lot of things from cuttings. I know you have a real affinity for native plants, don't you? I do, but I'm not limited to just native plants and other people won't be either. Vegetables, you could fill this whole greenhouse with vegetables and I have at the beginning. I could pick lettuce and tomatoes um, all year. And that's the beauty of it, year-round gardening in the greenhouse. Now on top of all the things that you say you must have, I know that you have a list of certain absolutes as far as what you don't do. I do and they're just as important to me as the do's. The big don'ts don't, no matter how much your friends beg you, do not bring in any of their plants, diseased or just to overwinter like ferns and stuff. Do not bring them in. They'll have bugs, they'll have maybe disease, and that's how we'll get started in the greenhouse. Another tip is to do not reuse your pots or your soil. And the reason for that is because certain contaminants can live on those pots and in that soil, and sanitation is key to a healthy greenhouse, so you're saying just get it out of here but at the same time, you can give those to somebody else and they can sterilize those pots and reuse them elsewhere. Yes, nothing is ruined, nothing is thrown out, all recycled. And that's all important. Now I have one more do for you and that's to check out our website at growingagreenerworld.com because Sherry has been nice enough to share with us the do's and don'ts and there are a lot more than she's had time to talk about today, so check it out on the website and enjoy that list. Now Sherry, I have one more question. This has got to be your garden journal, right? This little red book here? It is.